Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Curtis Peterson. I'm SVP of Operations at Ring Central. Also, am chair of the Architectural Council at Ring Central. So that we're kind of coming from both angles on this. And what we're talking about today is we serve customers a UCAS platform, and they want to do self-diagnosis. So we just came from the realm of, of automatic diagnosis, but this is customers who want to do self-diagnosis, and we have millions of endpoints that have lots of different reporting capabilities. So let's go to the, let's go what's into this a little bit here on here. So customers need a way to troubleshoot quality. Mean opinion score is the largely agreed upon way to do this. Unfortunately, not everybody implements it identically, so we start to get some variation in that. And then we talk about the scale. So we talk about Ring Central scale here, you know, billions of calls, millions of endpoints. Uh, those endpoints can be running different versions of software. Each leg of the call generates that. So if you've got a transfer in there, you've got a bridged meeting, you can have thousands of points in there. And we need to be able to present this information within a few seconds. We have need for this data inside our own application in order to do adaptive uh, rate changes on our codex, but then outside of that, we need to be able to present it very quickly as well. And then on top of that, we have 17 data centers globally, so we need to be able to run them out of every data centers and our endpoints or our users are in 156 countries. So piling all that data together starts, starts to present a couple of interesting issues. First, for MOS to be comparable on that scale, you know, one being bad, five being perfect, they need to be precise and accurate. You've got to get a regular response on that. And in the e-models, the two e-models that are already in, in published use, there's already a disconnect. So in one model, a G711 call, that's a codec, a standard call that you would have a telephone call on, the, the maximum MOS score is 4.41. And, and then another e-model, actually, the maximum score uh, is 4.19. Uh, so depending on the device or the version of the device or which software it's running in there, you might be able to have uh, different ones on there. So our network devices aren't even consistent in this. So we have border controllers that do reporting on MOS score in our infrastructure and border controllers respond differently. Even within model sequences of border controllers, they actually give out uh, different values on that. So the next one is all these edge devices. And at the bottom here, we have a you know, sample of what we support out there. So one, we have phones that are straight supported from Ring Central. We kind of know how those work. But then you go into our phone inventory, there's almost, almost 20,000 other versions of phones and versions of firmware that people connect to our platform. So they want to be able to report and diagnose their systems as well. Then we have mobile phones. They have their own issues and, and, and so forth on them uh, that, that report differently on there. Android has a little more information than iOS, for example, exposed at the network stack. Software clients, our own client, but um, oddly, we don't even put a MOS score on the client. We, we actually use this uh, training algorithm we're going to talk about to do the MOS score. Tablets, WebRTC, we know the issues inside there in terms of what they support or don't support. Great network availability stack if you take it outside and send it back through the socket, but native to the app, it's a, it's a little bit of a different experience. And then not just the voice world, we gotta be able to do the video world and, and so on, any media we stunt. The bottom line is this. For us engineers in the room, when we're troubleshooting something or we're looking at our code or we're looking at a system and we're try and trying to diagnose such quality issue, if you already know that you know device A goes on one scale and device B goes on another scale, you, you, you can reconcile non-matching scores. But if you're going to sell this and hand this out to 400,000 400, IT teams, you have to be rigidly concise on the comparison of those metrics. So if they're not comparable, it doesn't matter. We can't show it. So that was the problem set that we came up in there. And let's give a, you know, like a little build out, a simple example on this. This is what a typical call would look like in our network on here, and we're going to just, for the uh, sake of argument on here, we're going we're to pick on um, a blue user device hard phone. And the first reporting element as you move down the network stream is the session border controller. Um, in this case, uh, it could be Oracle, it could be anyone, uh, we, we even code our own, um, but it reports a 4.1. So very good MOS score uh, in the scale we're using here. To keep it simple, I'm not going to vary the network devices here. So our media server, which, which has our most advanced algorithms in it for detecting quality, it's going to score it also 4.1. I 
That call is going to continue because it's going to go out to somebody else on the other side uh, to a carrier endpoint. Again, our SBC is going to support on 4.1. Uh, the reason there's an NA on the other one is unless the carrier supports returning a MOS score to you on the other end, uh, you don't get an answer on that one. So we're about 50-50 on that. About 50% of our carriers will do it, 50% don't. But coming back, of course, we can score it again. It's going back through the same SBC, same HMP, back the other direction, and then the phone reports a 3.5. Okay, so either there's a problem with the downlink segment on the customer's network there, or we have a mismatch in the MOS scores. Now, putting that problem on the customer to figure out which is which is not really fair. So we're gonna go through a means of correcting these scores and normalizing them and putting together a method and a process that allows us to scale this, of course, to the size we mentioned before, and consistently retrain as more and more devices are added to their network or even normal things that we do, like upgrading our soft clients and putting new information in there. It needs to be able to represent that information correctly. So let's look at uh, some of the data that goes on here. As, as the gentleman was up here a little while ago, there's a lot of information in QoS coming out of devices, whether they're end user points or other ones on there. Our most verbose clients um, probably have somewhere around 400, 500 lines of total information in them. Our least verbose clients uh, is one of those uh, border controllers I mentioned again uh, a few seconds ago. It's like eight lines of data total. So, so there's not much information in those. And then gaps in what's filled in and not filled in. So some devices have the E model with the MOS score in them. Some devices don't even have that. They're just giving the network statistics in there. So our input layer was pretty, pretty, pretty standard in here. We took a look at our, our device being the most important, and we put a higher weighting on the HMP device that we build because we believe that's the most accurate model. It's a third-party module in there, but uh, it, it's the one we believe is the most accurate in there. And then we let the uh, input layers uh, speak on their, on their own. But in the hidden layers is all that just wonderfully juicy extra data that exists on some clients and doesn't exist on other clients. Now, if it wasn't for all that data, building a linear model wouldn't be very difficult. This would be a very simple math problem. We don't need anything special to jump through those hoops or get to the end result. But when you start looking again back at that billions of calls, uh, you know, almost 10,000 variations of the input data streams, you start looking at how quickly we need to do that, how fast we need to be able to retrain the model when a new device shows up, um, then that takes it out of any kind of linear math problem and, put, and puts you into an AI world. This is what our infrastructure looks like to do that. So I'll walk through this for a minute because this would apply to pretty much any system where you were collecting endpoint information on a measurement system. So this could be an IoT probe set and the manufacturer gives you the next lot number of IoT probes and they're a couple of degrees off or a degree off different on their temperature sensors. Um, these things happen and this is the same, same philosophy would apply on all of these. So our source information is largely our host media processor or in, inside our video or SFU um, session border controller. Um, not particularly friendly with its logging, no web capabilities there, so we have to put log stash next to it to keep it uh, sucking the logs off and ready to go into the other uh, devices. We have network probes throughout our network and in various places out there. And then as we showed in the slide a few minutes ago, the, the large realm of user devices that are, that are out there, the large variation that occurs. We bring that inside our own network into a set of Kafka clusters. Um, why? Because they're fast. Two, because they have uh, some permanence associated with them if you cluster them up correctly. And three, they're easy to deploy globally for us. Uh, so they fit well into our architecture and plan on that. Now, there's another piece of this picture here that's not really uh, relevant to how we're doing the customer presentation, but this data also flows into an op system where we do a lot of things similar to the previous pr presentation where we look at global trends on call stats, IO type devices. But leaving that to, to, to the gentleman who presented that very well, I'll drive down to what we started doing here. We do, first thing we do is we mirror the data inside the Kafka clusters, inside the Google Cloud infrastructure. We have an algorithm for picking a training call set. 
Uh, we train that through TensorFlow, um, and then we ob obtain a formula for that. And then we're able to take that same data and go straight into processing and into the data repository. Our application and web servers are all in here. Why do we have this all in here? Because our call volumes fluctuate wildly during the day. So in North America, for example, between 11 and 1, uh, we can have mm, 100,000, 200,000 records per second being recorded in this system. And at 1 o'clock in the morning, that might drop to 1,000, 2,000. So we need this quick capability to auto scale and so forth. That governance is all done out of the Kubernetes, et cetera. So the final product then, after we've gone through this uh, training set, which now looks like here, as we mentioned, we have a very discrete input layer, but the hidden layers are pretty deep in there. We, we chose a 500 cluster output because it was very simple to go zero to 500, and, and that's the MOS score range with two decimals in it. Uh, that's a little bit of a cheat hack on that. You're welcome to copy it if you want. Um, just remember, zero to, one, zero to 99 don't actually exist. Uh, so we actually used that as a checkpoint to make sure nothing showed up in that range. And um, out of that comes a real simple formula uh, on that. We train with about a million records. On that million record training session, we can train pretty quickly, uh, minutes, not hours. Uh, and the accuracy on that is about 96% or a little bit above. And again, the main point here is quick retraining. So as soon as we can find new devices in the network, things that are putting out different new numbers in there that we know aren't noise in the system that we're able to retrain to those devices. So here's our results. So as we mentioned, 96% accuracy. How accurate did it need to be? Um, not this high. <laughs> So in future iterations, we're going to do some uh, improvements in speed on that. We've already put some of those in production, but uh, uh, not, not in time for this, this conversation. The 75th percentile human can only distinguish about a 0.46 difference in MOS. That's across video and audio. That's a cited re uh, study that came out about three years ago, so it's actually relatively recent in the MOS world. So our degree of precision is only, only in about that range. I know in our world, we want much finer numbers than that, so we can do our analytics and then the BI that comes off the back of that, and even large-scale AI on finding uh, problem spots, as again the previous uh, presenter showed. But in terms of actual human perception in there until you're dropping uh, about that, it's not going to come up as a, as a key issue on that. Uh, greatest example of that is you know there's a little bit of quality difference between probably a really good desk phone and your mobile phone. Um, but in reality, that's about a 0.2 MOS difference uh, on the average call. So now we have the ability to run all of us through the formula, and we have a unified MOS score. So all of them are hard comparable to each other. We're correcting uh, the manufacturers that used a, a system or a formula that we didn't want to use uh, to the system that we weighted uh, most heavily for ourselves. And now, what do we do on that? We take that and show that as a very easy, direct, and straightforward way for the user to identify that on them. Um, business outcomes are early in terms of reduction of customer support cases on this, um, but the number one uh, metric we've come back so far is presenting well-established metrics that customers can use that are normalized correctly are the key decision point of, of enterprise accounts in purchasing products. So, in that realm, I, I do recommend to the room here that when you're thinking about the large scale of things, um, to sometimes get a little out of the engineering world and come into the how do we position the product world, this is really great, uh, great open uh, area to do so. So let's go about, you know, let's jump into that final output stage on there. So gone are the big long paragraphs of information that are in raw text on there. And these scores that we put out here, we, we clicked in this particular call. There's two people that's a member of the call, and we're looking specifically at Francis Cohen here. And uh, we simplified it pictorially so you can take a look at it. And from us to the client, we're good. That's a 4.4 MOS score. We went to that scale, by the way, as you might already notice. And then on the other way, um, so from the client to the server, we're seeing about 3.3. And it looks like uh, it's, it's largely around packet loss in this particular case on there. 
We do provide additional information that, as I mentioned before, was, was really covered in the previous presentation here. But now we know those hard values aren't based on differences in equipment, differences in software versions, differences in the implementation of the particular Kodak. One of our manufacturers acquired somebody, so even though the phones have the same stickers on them, the same logos on them and everything else, they produce wildly different results. We have been able to create an AI algorithm that puts out an exact normalized value on all that. This is simple for somebody to understand. You can hand it to a help desk technician right away. Getting a little deeper in that, we also take a look at the aggregated information on this. This is more of a executive presence, but again, to prove that we are delivering the MOS that we guarantee in our contracts and so forth, if we don't have a unified MOS scoring, we have to start going through explanations of why device X is really great if it's here, but device Y should be up here. We've actually normalized that across uh, both sides of that. On that, I believe it takes some questions. Thank you, Curtis.